Hi, I'm Matt. I'm Mel. I'm Lisa. And this is the No Fear Podcast, the podcast where we dissect horror and all the things that scare us. This is Season 2, Episode 17, and for this episode, we have a very special treat. We recently had the chance to talk to Paul Tremblay, author of A Head Full of Ghosts, Disappearance at Devil's Rock, and the soon-to-be-released Cabin at the End of the World. Okay, so we are here with Paul Tremblay, author of Head Full of Ghosts, Disappearance at Devil's Rock, and the upcoming Cabin at the End of the Woods. So thanks for joining us here on the No Fear podcast, Paul. Sure, thanks. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we, we, you know, we wanted to just first start with some general questions about your writing, because um, I know a little bit about you through social media. And what I know is that you're a math teacher by day. I am. And you write stories that terrify us by <laughs> night. Um, <laughs> so I thought we could start with, um, I mean, first, where do you draw your inspiration from? Um, geez, that's always like, I feel like a hard question, but interesting one to answer. And, and I, I, occasionally I like to think about it though. I, I the, although I fear, if I think about it too much, it'll like jinx the process because <laughs> <laughs> right. um, I usually start thinking about all the things I'm juggling and then it's like, how does it get done? But it just sort of does get done. Um, I don't know. I, I think, you know, I've been a, a lifelong fan in, of horror and a lifelong scaredy cat. So um, I, I, I just tend to be drawn to that stuff. I mean, when I was a kid, I wasn't a huge reader, but in, in New England, we had a, uh, this is pre-cable TV, I'm aging myself, but in New England when I was really young, so young, <laughs> Um, there was a show called Creature Double Feature on Saturday afternoons. Um, and they would show, the first movie would typically be a, a kaiju kind of movie, which were my favorites, you know, when I was, you know, eight, nine, ten. And the second movie was more of like a straightforward horror movie, you know, maybe a black and white movie or, or a Hammer horror film uh, or a horror film from the Hammer company in, in England. And those movies typically scared the hell out of me. Um, <laughs> So I don't know. It's funny. My younger brother, who's five years younger, also became like a huge horror fan. And he, he's actually a lot more sort of hardcore horror than I am. And then when I was as a kid, it was sort of a joke. Like, even though he was five years younger than me, uh, we'd be watching Poltergeist or something like that. And the scene where they ripped the face off in the mirror, I'd be like, come on, Dan. I'd take him by the hand and lead him out. You can't watch this. And it was really because I didn't want to watch it. Right. Um, yeah, you know, and I, you know, because I was the older brother, I would send him upstairs first, like the canary in the coal mine. And if he if he survived going upstairs at night, then it was okay for me to go upstairs. Um, so you know, it's funny. It's just been so long. It, like horror has been such like a big part of my life. It's it's almost hard to envision when it wasn't. Um, you know, that said, even though like my first two novels that were published were, were weird crime novels, to me, that was sort of the outlier. That was me like trying out this crime thing because I just happened to have a, a story idea. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, in my day to day life, I tend to be a considerer of worst case scenarios. Uh, you know, I try not to go too far down those holes, but I think, you know, I just think of situations and sort of spin like where, where, where uh, you know, where, where do they go? And they tend to go to dark places and that's not always a nice thing, <laughs> uh, to, to always be thinking about that stuff. But so maybe part of me tries to write that stuff so I can get it out of me kind of thing. So kind of like a catharsis. Yeah, a little bit. Um, but, you know, I definitely don't feel like I, I think that's part of it. But like when I finish something, like I definitely don't feel like, oh, that's out of me now. I'm never going to worry about it again. <laughs> it definitely doesn't work that way. And there are some topics that scare me so much. I don't think I could go there writing. Um, you know, as a child of the 80s, uh, you know, I used to have a ton of like nuclear war nightmares. And now that's sort of coming back. Uh, into our geopolitical sphere, if it ever left. And I don't know, I don't think I could, like, for example, like I can't read Cormac McCarthy's The Road, not because it wouldn't be a good novel, but just because I think it would, it would just affect me too much. So going back to some of those earliest influences, what were some of the movies that stuck with you? <laughs> you mentioned Poltergeist. Right. But... Yeah. Well, I think the, the movie that really had like a, like a lifelong impact on me was Jaws. I saw it when I was in fifth grade and it was like, oddly enough, being shown at our high school. Uh, uh, so, I don't, you know, so this was like 1981, 82 or something like that. Um, 
if for some reason they were showing, and this is stuff that happened in the eighties. I kind of feel like, Oh, we'll show a movie at the high school. <laughs> right. You know, so my dad took me and you know, that movie, I loved it, but it messed me up. I had shark nightmares for, you know, five to 10 years after that. And I'm not exaggerating every dream that I remember would end up, I'd end up in the water and like, Oh no, I hope Jaws doesn't come. And Jaws would always come. Uh, so that was, you know, to me, like that was a movie that really, you know, scared me. Um, and it's funny, like some of these other movies, like really old movies that I remember, certainly, you know, now years later, I can look back and see that they had an impact. And some of them are really goofy, like, uh, the attack of the killer shrews. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but it's, <laughs> it's laughably bad. I mean, it was featured on mystery science theater 3000 once, but you know, I remember, I don't know, it was sort of a siege movie and these giant like rat monsters were attacking people. And as a child that really sort of scared me. Um, <laughs> I, I can imagine why. <laughs> yeah. You know, so otherwise, I don't know. Uh, I mean, for Jaws to me, it was definitely like a formative, a formative experience. I, I'd say that one above all as a kid. So you're not going to be one of these um, to go to uh, one of these outdoor showings of Jaws where they have people floating in the lake as they're watching uh, it? Yeah, I don't think I could do that. Uh, I have seen it on the big screen within the past five years. That was a lot of fun. And I will, I mean, I've probably seen the movie 50 times now. I think that's a conservative estimate. But I still will not watch Quint get bit in half. Like I saw it in fifth grade, um, and I, I remember watching it. And uh, I'm afraid to to rewatch it. Um, so like even I watched it with my daughter when she was like 11 or 12, fairly recently. And you know I I put a pillow over my face during the scene where where, where Quint where Quint gets eaten. I just I just won't watch that scene again. I've seen many more gory and much more worse sort of violence you know films, you know since then. But you know, sure. I just I just remember what it felt like being uh, 10 slash 11 watching that. And I don't want to go back there necessarily. <laughs> yeah, there's something about the kid's imagination when it when it confronts something really horrific. Um, I remember my grandmother used to babysit me <laughs> and she used to show me for some reason the Vincent Price movie um, House of Wax. Oh, wow. And that was what she did. She, you know, she would pop popcorn and we'd sit down and watch it. And <laughs> to this day, I have trouble with wax figurines in museums. Um, they just, I can't, it goes somewhere primal almost <laughs> when I think yeah. about it. No, I mean, um, those, I mean, dolls and wax figures are already sort of creepy and uncanny anyway, but yeah, I can totally, I can totally get that. Now I want, now I can't go to wax museums. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> So I, I think I remember we uh, listeners, Mel and I attended StokerCon and we got to hear um, Paul talk on the Shirley Jackson panel. And I remember you saying that you came to writing a little bit later, um, yeah. that that was something you decided to go into a little bit later. And you mentioned specifically Joyce Carol Oates and how she had an influence in that. Yeah, sure. So when I was, you know, when I was in high school, uh, I don't know, TV was my thing. I mean, I, I really wasn't a very popular student. I was really small and skinny. Um, you know, I'm thin now, but I'm like 200 pounds. But, you know, when I, when I was in high, I, when I graduated high school, I weighed only 140 pounds. So super skinny. Um, I don't know. So my escape for me was TV and actually, uh, the, the Boston Celtics were really good. So I was a huge Larry Bird basketball fan. So I either watched TV or was out in my driveway shooting free throws. So I wasn't reading books. So, you know, fast forward into college and uh, I just stuck with math because I was always good at it. Uh, and through a weird set of circumstances, I ended up a double major of math and humanities. But my, my humanities major, excuse me, it was just really a hodgepodge of like history classes, philosophy. And then second semester senior year, I took my first and only college English class. It was, event, it was essentially English Lit 101. So I was in there with all freshmen as a second semester senior. But the professor was so cool and, you know, kind of like, you know, the English teacher that you always want to have. And, you know, he connected with me through music because I was a big and still am a big punk fan. And, and so was he. So, you know, he knew how to use that to sort of like pull me into the class. Um, anyway, within that class, we read Joyce Carol Oates' Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? And, and I remember reading that and thinking, I, I, didn't, I didn't know, I didn't realize that people wrote stuff like this. And I was just totally energized by it. Um, and then almost like a, a month later, it was my 21st birthday. And my girlfriend, who's now my wife, bought me the stand for my birthday because she was a big Stephen King fan. So, you know, between reading The Oat Story and Stephen King, it made me fall in love with reading, which was really odd. Because, you know, I went off to the University of Vermont for two years to, to struggle through my math program to get a master's. 
Um, and what I really found instead was a passion for reading. Like I, I was just up in this cold <laughs> Vermont area for two years and I just read every King book I could find and more oats. And, you know, I sort of branched out from there. Um, and at the end of those two years, I got my first high school math teaching job, but I also had like this weird itch to try writing a story. I'm interested. You said that uh, music was played a really big role, uh, especially at that time. Does music influence your writing in any way? Oh, definitely. Um, and especially when I first started out, I, I mean, I still go to my favorite songs and bands for, for song titles sometimes. I mean, A Head Full of Ghosts is a riff on a, a bad religion song called My Head is Full of Ghosts. Um, you know, one of my favorite things now, even with my novels, is finding like epigraphs from songs. So absolutely, uh, you know, some of my favorite bands and, and their lyricists are certainly inspiring me as much, if not more, than you know, some of the people that I read. Take another band example would be the band Clutch and Neil Fallon's lyrics. You know, I'm, you could find some old short stories where I sort of take some of his lyrics, you know, just warm them into the to the story somehow. So, yeah, I've always been sort of a frustrated musician at heart. You know, before I started messing around with music, I did sort of teach myself how to play guitar and wanted to be a punk musician. But, uh, you know, I eventually and actually fairly quickly found out I had a better shot at being a writer than a musician. <laughs> Well, since you um, mentioned Head Full of Ghosts, I I do want to talk about that a little bit. Um, sure. First of all, that, I love the book. Uh, I really you. enjoyed reading it. And it's, I found it in a really odd way. I was in a bookstore, an independent bookstore in Memphis, Tennessee. And I walked in and I got so excited that they had a proper horror section that I think I actually squealed in the store. <laughs> And it made, made the guy behind the counter come over to me and he, and I said, Oh, I'm sorry. I just got excited. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> he said, Oh, well you like horror. I just read this book and literally handed me he a head full of ghosts. Um, uh, oh, that's <laughs> so cool. And I, I, I said, okay. And he said, you just, you should read this. And I bought it and went home and devoured it. Um, but I love stories like that because this book to me feels like one of those books that you read <laughs> and you just want to pass on to somebody <laughs> and say, you have to read this book. Thanks. Um, yeah. you know, in, I would say independent stores, not to interrupt, have been like great with, you know, uh, hand selling. Is that Laurelwood? Is that the name of the store in Memphis that you went to by any chance? It is. Well, it's yeah. not Laurelwood anymore. It's, I think they've okay. changed owners. But yes, that's the yeah. one I went to. I remember at the time, <laughs> I, I before the book came out, I heard from like one or two of the the booksellers at that store. I know that they were really excited. <laughs> you know, like, can you come to Memphis? I'm like, ah, I don't think my publisher would, is going to do that. So no, I mean, that's very cool. I mean, I, uh, those guys were, were, were huge supporters of the book, especially in the early going. Yeah. Uh, well, they were <laughs> because, yeah. um, uh, they were very enthusiastic and they got me to read it. Um, but when I read it, then I got excited seeing all the Shirley Jackson references. And so, <laughs> I definitely, I don't have any specific questions, but I'm hoping you'll talk a little bit about Shirley Jackson and how she's influenced and shaped your writing, particularly that novel. Sure. Um, you know, so my first, I think, well, my first exposure, which I, I guess to be fair was in sixth grade reading the lottery. And I remember thinking, you know, I was a sixth grade boy who didn't have a ton of interest in reading that it was a cool story, you know? So that was just sort of in the past that, okay, lottery, you know, stoning people to death. How cool is that? Um, <laughs> Then, so when I first became a reader, when I was at the University of Vermont, you know, when I read Stephen King's Dance Maca uh, Dance Macabre, you know, obviously talks quite a bit about Shirley Jackson. So, you know, through him, I, I found, you know, The Haunting of Hill House, um, you know, and read some more of her short stories. But it really wasn't until I was a little bit older and really starting to get serious about writing and, and even horror fiction in general that I sort of dove deeper into what Shirley wrote. Um, that's when I read The Sundial and, of course, um, We Have Always Lived in the Castle, which is my favorite book of hers. Um, you know, so when I read that, and that probably wasn't until maybe a year or so before the Shirley Jackson Awards even started, um, you know, that book just blew me away. I just loved the voice. I loved the characters and uh, her ambiguity and her sense of humor. Um, I think that's really unique how, how, you know, she evokes, you know, how she's able to evoke such like a, a feeling of oddness and strangeness and at the same time have, um, you know, have humor that doesn't really undercut the creepiness or anything that happens before it. Um, yeah. So, I mean, just became, I think a really important sort of time in my 
writing career, which is sort of very early. I just started searching for an agent kind of thing. Um, I feel like she really helped, you know, reading her stuff and rereading her stuff because I've since reread uh, Castle many times. Um, I feel like really helped helped grow my own writing. Yeah, I think if if somebody is wanting to be a writer or at least take writing seriously, they could they really should look to a person like Shirley Jackson. Um, just for so so many of the reasons that you listed. No, absolutely. And uh, I mean, for those who, you know, listening that, you know, I haven't read a head full of ghosts. Uh, there were definitely some, uh, I don't even know if we can call them head nods or winks. Cause I think it's more than that. Uh, <laughs> references to, to, to Shirley Jackson's. We have always lived the castle with, but certainly my character, Mary being named after Mary Cat Blackwood from the novel. Well, we, we decided before this episode was recorded that we were going to try to avoid spoilers on your books so that people who haven't read them can sure. go and read them with fresh eyes. But um, Yeah, well, I mean, Headful Ghost has been out for a few years, so I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it has been. If you want to um, be spoiler, spoilery or not. I'll protect the new books, obviously. Okay, yeah, <laughs> we'll, pr- we'll protect yeah. the newer ones. But yeah. Headful of Ghosts deals with, um, I guess, the theme of exorcism um, because there's still a lot of ambiguity yeah. in the book. But um, what I, I really want to make the pun and say what possessed you <laughs> to, <laughs> to, write a, um, to kind of tackle that theme um, in, in so, a horror novel. Yeah. So, I mean, it's funny. So this was, geez, February. I can remember where the idea hit me because it was one of those very rare sort of eureka moments. I think writers dream of getting like where a story just sort of hits you because it, it never really happens that way or it never had before, really, for me. Um, it was February of 2013. I was 100 pages into this other novel that I was really struggling with. And it wasn't a horror. And I actually hadn't written a horror novel to that point yet. All my short fiction had been pretty much horror, but my, my, my previous novels were either crime or humorous. Um, so it was 100 pages to other novel that wasn't really working. And I happened to be reading this book of essays about the movie, the film, The Exorcist. It was published by Centipede Press. Um, that it's part of their studies in the night film series. That's a wonderful book. There's a lot of, you know, there's interviews with the cast and the crew, but there's a lot of critical essays about the movie. And when I was reading, uh, there was one essay in particular I was reading that, uh, that discussed the movie in reference to the time it came out and a lot of the politics within the movie and the politics of the time in the 1970s. And I don't know, that movie was so iconic, I'd never really thought about it in those terms. You know, to me, it was just like, oh, it's the scariest movie ever. Um, and that really sort of excited me thinking about uh, sort of the underlying politics of what was going on. So I actually, I put, I, I literally put that essay collection down and thought, huh, you know, people, you know, within horror, you know, we've had, and this was 2013, you know, the zombie novel had been kicking a lot of butt, obviously, and, you know, zombies were everywhere. Uh, there had been some recent literary updates of the, the werewolf and the vampire never seems to go away. I had a hard time thinking, geez, when's the last time there's been like a, you know, a literary book or even like a big book that dealt with possession. So I was like, geez, how would I do it? And right away I knew it was like, I wanted to, to totally play the fence. I wanted the whole book. I knew from the beginning that the book was going to be never tell the reader outright if someone actually was possessed or, or maybe nothing supernatural was happening. And I don't know, I had the two sisters and it really sort of just came to me so quickly. And I'm glad it did because it was kind of hard to give up on that other novel. I was already hundred pages into, but I was just so excited for the idea of this book. Um, I was brave enough in my own little world to put away that other novel and, uh, and dive into a head full of ghosts. Um, yeah. And I mean, otherwise, I would also say, you know, besides, you know, besides the story itself, I mean, for those that read it, there are all these like blog entries that sort of discuss what's happening in the story. But it, it's also my, it was also my chance to, to talk about what I loved about horror and what I thought, what, what I didn't like about horror, too. So for me, that book was like, I don't know, a lot of ways on a personal level, it's about like my lifelong love uh, and hate of horror. It hates too strong a word, but it's the horror that I don't like, I guess. I got to talk about a little bit. Um, man, that was a really rambly answer. Did I, did I keep close to answering <laughs> the question? Yeah. It did. And I, I mean, when I was reading it, it reminded me a lot. I don't know if you've read this book, um, Ray Russell's The Case Against Satan, um, which came out in yeah, the early say, 60s. I right. I didn't read it until it was reprinted fairly recently uh, with an intro from Laird Barron. So I read right. it after A Head Full of Ghosts. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, just just kind of the, the idea of, 
uh, you know, a lot of those stories don't take into consideration the, the, like you said, the, the politics and the, the things that might be going on around it and the doubt that would happen, um, surrounding what seems to be a supernatural event. And I, I really appreciated that as a reader. Well, thanks. I would say one of the other essays, just to go back to that book of essays, which I highly recommend, you know, there was really um, a really long journalistic uh, or investigative journalism piece on that supposed case that inspired Blatty's novel. And, and you know, this journalist essentially came to the conclusion that it was all bunk. And not only, like, and he even had a hard, he even thinks that the priest that supposedly created or did the perform the exorcism isn't real. Like he couldn't find evidence that this person actually existed. Um, so that was like a nice part of it too. It was like, oh yeah, you know, like to, to really take the doubter's point of view. Like I feel like um, exorcism and possession novels that had come beforehand really hadn't like totally embraced sort of a doubter's point of view for, for at least for large parts of the story. So that was kind of fun too. Even though I knew that I wanted to try to build the case for both sides evenly, it was fun building that doubter's case. While we're on the subject of Head Full of Ghosts, I do need to chime in for a second because, like Lisa said, this is the sort of book that you, makes you really want to pass it on to somebody else. <laughs> and, Thank uh, you. And uh, my wife has read it. We've had several discussions that are not quite arguments about whether or not it's possessed <laughs> or not. But yeah. uh, my daughter is, well, she just turned 17. I got it, mm-hmm. her a copy of this book last summer when she was visiting for the summer. And... Uh, so you, Lisa's already basically asked the question that she had <laughs> asked me to ask. No, no, it's fine about the yeah, inspiration, yeah. but I did want to pass on that about, uh, she told me to tell you that she loved the book. So from a 16 year old horror nerd, um, uh, apparently you've done something right. Oh, thank you. That's awesome. But I, I, I did want to kind of add into Lisa's question about, um, in sure. terms of inspiration, just uh, what, what made you decide to bring in the reality TV aspect of it? Because that was something that. <laughs> I thought it was having read the synopsis of the book before I started reading it. I thought, now this can be really interesting. And, and it was, it played out really well. Um, what was there, was there any like deeper inspiration for that? Or was it just, you thought it would be cool? (laughs) Um, I think so when I tried to approach, like I tried to approach, I guess the whole story as realistically as possible. So when I, when I sat down at the very early stages and thought, all right, so if someone's actually going to attack an exorcism in this day and age in like a suburb, as opposed to some like, um, it's, as opposed to like some very rural area where people don't have much contact with each other. Cause a lot of the recent movies have had that sort of like the last exorcism, right. They were sort of in a very rural area, weren't connected to the neighbors very much. I felt like if this was going to take place in Beverly, which I knew I wanted to, to put it near Salem, um, you know, it's a suburb, but there's still like 30, 40,000 people around. Like word would get out. Like this kid was acting strange in school and, you know, with social media, I, I kind of felt like to me, it would only be natural that word would get out. And yeah, why not have a reality TV crew come in? And once I sort of hit on that idea, I thought it was a perfect way to, to continue to enhance the unreliability or the, or the ambiguity of the story. Because um, I mean, I think at this point, everyone's pretty hip to the idea that you know, reality TV shows, <laughs> you know, aren't very real. So, uh, I, th- you know, once I sort of stumbled on that idea, uh, I thought it would just be, oh, perfect, you know, a perfect way to sort of build the ambiguous case on, on either side. Well, it definitely does make you question the narrator quite a bit, <laughs> even more than I think uh, right. you would have before. I- I was thinking while you were talking about the, riding the fence and keeping, you know, the unreliability going and the ambiguity. This is a more general question, sure. but like, do you feel like one of horror's strengths is its ability to use those aspects of unreliability and ambiguity? I mean, is that kind of one of the things that makes for a good horror story? Yeah, no, I, I definitely think so. And it's not to say that every horror uh, story has to be that way, but for me, most of my favorites kind of play with ambiguity. And, and I would say even, um, you know, the works of literature and film that aren't horror stories sort of address our sort of ambiguous uh, existence. I mean, to me, that's like one of the big questions of life is, um, you know, what, what is this that we're living through? Like, you know, we, we have ideas, we have beliefs, and we, you know, we even have obviously science, but we ultimately don't know. Um, so I've always sort of been fascinated by how 
sort of what we assume is ironclad, like uh, reality or identity, uh, can be really, or not can be, they are a lot more malleable than, than we want to think they are. So like even like my first crime novel, The Little Sleep, featured this narcoleptic private detective. Um, so when he fell asleep, he'd had these weird dreams that he would have a hard time discerning what was real. And so, you know, and some of that was about like how the memories of his childhood were sort of not really what happened. And that, you know, that actually sort of happens again with Mary, right? I mean, she's telling the story as an adult, so there's the question that, you know, granted she went through something very traumatic, but, you know, even as a 23, 24 year old, would she remember exactly what happened when she was eight? Um, and then, you know, she's there watching, you know, she has <laughs> this, this public record, this, this um, you know, the reality TV episodes, she can go back and does go back uh, and watches those, you know, how does that mess, you know, how does that twist her own reality or how does that twist her own identity? So. I don't know. I think for a horror story, those are, you know, just, uh, you know, fertile fields to play in. Um, I feel like there's almost like endless possibilities to mess around with that. I don't know how familiar you are with Jean Baudrillard, the philosopher, but that reminds me of his book about simulation and simulacra, uh, hmm. where... I'm going to, this is not like from his book, but this is just the, the right. metaphor that works best is how The Godfather was, you know, this movie that was based on a book that was sort of loosely based on reality. But then after its success, mobsters then started watching it to learn how to act <laughs> as a mobster. Uh, and I, I think yeah. The Sopranos sort of had a similar effect on people. And it, yeah, like Mary watching these reality things, I mean... As I was reading that, and, and once I got to kind of that realization, I was like, oh, you know, it, it reminds me a lot of those stories you get told of when you were like three or four that you don't quite remember, but you've heard right. so many yeah. times it feels like a memory, only if it were a reality show that was also possibly staged. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, just loved that. Sorry. It was just no, that, no, it's a great <laughs> metaphor. And it had, uh, yeah, I, I am not familiar with that philosopher, but... Uh, <laughs> No, I, I think that's a fantastic metaphor for it. Um, yeah, the idea of, you know, what people tell you about yourself, you know, affects you in, in, in ways that you're not even sure about. And it, that would probably really add um, to a movie version. So I'd like to ask <laughs> you about, in a very weak segue, sure. um, <laughs> about the potential of a movie head full of ghosts. Yeah, it's been in development for a while. They actually uh, optioned it way back, like a month before the book was originally released. So, you know, Focus Features and uh, Team Downey, the production company, and Allegiance Theater is the other production company. You know, this has been in the works for a while. Um, you know, so I'm, you know, even though it's a few years later, I'm, you know, I'm very happy that they're clearly interested enough to keep it going because they just announced that they hired... Um, Osgood Perkins to direct and uh, maybe rewrite the script as well, which, you know, I'm very excited about because uh, I'm a huge fan of Osgood's two films, two recent films, uh, The Black Coat's Daughter and uh, I'm the Pretty Thing That Lives in This House. I think both are wonderful. I think he's a really good match for hopefully, you know, the ambiguity and even just the relationship between the sisters is both his movies sort of deal with uh, um, a relationship between young female characters um, yeah, so I, I honestly, I really don't know too much more than that. Uh, I did become friendly with uh, the screenwriters who worked on it for a couple of years, uh, uh, Luke Piotrowski and, and Ben Davis Collins. They wrote the screenplay for uh, Super Dark Times. I don't know if you saw that, but it's on Netflix now. I highly recommend it. Um, yeah, they were very friendly. You know, they, they kept me sort of in the loop of what was happening behind the scenes. Um, so they're not with the project anymore. So my, my, uh, my, my information... Uh, my information leak is no longer there, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I'm excited. Hopefully, you know, things are going well with that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I talked about this a little, little bit, like the idea of, you know, my talking about horror. I mean, the, the book is obviously a lot about influence as well. I mean, it, the book is indirect conversation with, with Blatty's the exorcist and, and, you know, I bring in the Shirley Jackson stuff. So, you know, I'm very interested to see, you know, what, what someone else, how someone else filters the story, you know, through their own sort of point of view. Yeah. And I think, I think Perkins is a perfect, <laughs> a perfect match for that story. Um, because he, he does, he, he tells 
he tells this kind of haunting, um, it, yeah, ambiguous. And we've been throwing around that word this whole time, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, he does tell that so well, um, those stories. So I'm excited. I'm excited to see what will come out of that. No, um, yeah, definitely. All fingers and toes crossed that it, <laughs> that it, that it, that it actually makes it to screen. <laughs> right. Well, talking about movie and uh, film influences, when I read Disappearance at Devil's Rock, which came out after Head Full of Ghosts, right. um, I kept thinking of Picnic at Hanging Rock, and I wasn't sure if I was making that connection or if you intended that <laughs> when you were writing it. Um, but that, that's one of my absolute favorite films. So... I don't know. Was that intentional or did I just dream that up because of the title? Oh, no. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it definitely was. Uh, in fact, in a weird way, it felt like a roundabout way. Cause that story was like, you know, a head full of ghosts. I felt like came to me almost fully formed disappearance at devil's rock was a full on battle <laughs> to figure <laughs> out what the heck was happening in the book to finally get it to where it was. It was one of the hardest rights I've ever had, um, as a writer. So in some ways, I'm quite proud of that book because it was such a struggle. But anyway, in a roundabout way, that book really became sort of informed by three Australian movies that I, you know, I'm a huge fan of. Um, one is Picnic and Hanging Rock. Obviously, you know, the title is certainly an allusion to it. Uh, I think people could rightly accuse me of of that book being fan fiction for the movie Lake Mungo, uh, which came out, geez, probably like 10, a little over 10 years ago or maybe 10 years ago. Uh, just a huge fan of that movie. Uh, and in the paperback of Disappearance of Devil's Rock, I talk about this sort of like in the liner notes a little bit. Um, in the third movie, um, I've only seen once because it's really harrowing. It's sort of a, a true crime sort of movie. It's called The Snowtown Murders. Yeah. Um, it was weird how it's like these three Australian movies sort of fit together. But, I, you know, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm a magpie as a writer, so I'm always pulling from all sorts of you know influences, I think. Certainly Stuart O'Nan's... Um, Songs for the Missing was certainly a book that I thought about when I was writing that as well. His Songs for the Missing plays the disappearance of a, an older teenager, one who's about to go off to college. He plays it a lot more realistic and basically takes you through the heart-wrenching process of what actually happens when, you know, someone goes missing. Um, yeah, but uh, so I guess the short answer is definitely Picnic and Hanging Rock is an awesomely strange movie by Peter Weir. So this is The Last Wave, which I didn't watch until recently, but if you haven't seen that, I would recommend it. It's even more messed up than uh, Picnic and Hanging Rock. <laughs> I haven't seen it. Um, and I think that's because I don't think I've gotten my fill of, of Picnic and Hanging Rock yet because it's one of those <laughs> movies I keep going back and rewatching. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I have re- Have you tried reading the book? I haven't. By any chance? Yeah. No. I, I bought the Criterion Collection, actually came with the book, and I started reading it. Um, and I got distracted, so I, and I put it down. So I'm going to have to try again at some point. I'll have to try that. Well, I heard that they're remaking it. Um, oh, really? Netflix, I, I think. Oh, um, I don't I know much that. about it. Um, I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah. I <laughs> but, don't know um, about that either. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll watch it, I'm sure. Um, yeah. But I don't know. You know, pe- people can have their remakes or whatever. <laughs> we have the originals. Um, exactly. <clears throat> but yeah, Mel, you're reading this book right now. I am. Yes. I, I'm about a third of the way through. Uh, so that some of the kind of supernatural stuff is kicking in. I was telling Lisa last night, I'm, I'm not reading it before bed anymore. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really enjoying it so far. Well, thanks. Well, you made it through the slowest part, the first third. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it kept me in there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I told her we, I would be very careful about the questions I asked about this book so that I wouldn't spoil it for her. But oh, okay, um, good, yeah. <laughs> I will say this was one, I mean, I, I enjoyed Head Full of Ghosts and I read it very quickly and Disappearance at Devil's Rock, I kept having to put down and come back to because it produced so much anxiety in me when I was reading it that, um, I don't know, it almost went beyond terror. Like at certain <laughs> points, it would just kind of like clutch me around my throat and I was like, okay, I have to yeah. put this away. Oh. <laughs> Well, I'm so glad, I mean, that it had that effect on you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, a head full of ghosts, I think, in a lot of ways is, I don't know, it's fun because there's all sorts of stuff going on. There's a lot more pyrotechnics. You know, and Devil's Rock is certainly more of a slow burn. And, it, you know, it, there isn't, I guess, that fun element to it. Um, but, yeah, no, I'm proud of the book. Um, I mean, one of the reasons it was hard is because, I mean, when I was writing the book, my son was the age, or right around the age of Tommy, 
And I really had to purposefully detach from that, make Tommy purposefully not like my son. Um, I actually made him like the physical copy of some kid that lives down the street. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, kid that lives down the sorry. street. <laughs> yeah. Whereas, you know, like with my other books, like A Head Full of Ghosts, there's a lot of like my family stuff in there. Um, you know, and, and Mary, as an eight-year-old, there's a lot like my daughter. I mean, that stuff I could handle. But, you know, I know I couldn't do that to my, you know, I, Devil's Rock was hard enough to write without dealing with anyone like sort of resembling my, my own kids. So I, I understand what you mean about, you know, because I know uh, you're a parent being anxious about the happenings and, going yeah. and the goings on <laughs> of that movie, uh, of that book, excuse me. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, it, 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 yeah, it is. I think cause it's that connection to it and you're right that it doesn't have, um, I don't know if you want to call it the fun aspects of head full of right. ghosts because that book got so dark in places. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, it, yeah, it did. It, it la it did lack a little bit of that. Um, but it almost had kind of the Joyce Carol Oates. Like I felt that that influenced more in that book than I did in something like Head Full of Ghosts. Yeah, um, I, I definitely, well, thank you. I definitely thought a lot more about Joyce and the story I mentioned earlier, clearly w with this book, uh, you know, without getting spoilery, <laughs> than I did with the previous book. You know, it's funny, I, you know, I'm just sort of realizing now, I, it seems to think, you know, I know people in general have liked A Head Full of Ghosts more, but it seems like the people who actually are parents yeah. connect with Devil's Rock yeah, and the people who, you know, I'm not like saying people don't have kids or are bad people. I'm just saying they had a hard, they had a harder time, I think, connecting with, with the book, which I totally get. I mean, I think, um, obviously, a lot of my own parental anxieties <laughs> made its way into uh, the Devil's Rock. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it did. I think it that helped um, connect to it. But you know, the family dynamic. I really loved the family in Devil's Rock, um, and. I liked how they interacted with each other when they did. And that was very um, fulfilling, I think, as a reader. Uh, they, I, they felt like a real, um, there was a real love and trust and loyalty and, um, but also kind of humor in the face of really horrible circumstances. Yeah. Um, well, thank I don't you. know, I liked that family a lot. Thanks. Yeah, it was funny, I guess, in a weird way those are the characters I've spent the most time with. Cause that, that book took me, I don't know, maybe like a year and a half or so to write. And it was my longest book by far. In fact, the first draft had 10,000 more words you know, that I cut out um, when I, you know, sent it to my editor and we edited it. So it was my longest book. It took me the longest. So yeah, in a weird way, I've more than any of my characters, I spent more time with Kate and Elizabeth than I have, uh, you know, and the other characters than, than any other ones. So thank you. I'm glad that uh, they worked for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I can feel that, um, that there, um, and that you mentioned, is that going to be a movie as well? Hopefully. Um, no, it's funny. I think a few things working against it, you know, it's funny uh, people who like to look, Oh, this is so cinematic. And like the, 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 co a lot of the comments we've got back from people that my agent has pitched it to is like, Oh, we really like the book, but we don't think it, we don't think it's filmable. And I'm like, really? Um, like, okay. But I, you know, it's funny. The book also came out, <laughs> It came out the same summer that Stranger Things came out. So I would get like a lot of like, hey, this crazy show on Netflix, it begins just like your book does. But then obviously um, Stranger Things goes off into a, a much more fun, <laughs> happy, not happy, <laughs> but much more fun, exciting direction than sort of this, you know, really dark, um, even though there are maybe supernatural elements to Devil's Rock, you know, very sort of dark and realistic, more dark, realistic approach, I guess, to the material. So. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it would be nice uh, if it did, but yeah, as of as of now, uh, nothing nothing going on with the film rights for that one. Ah, uh, I mean, I, I guess I can understand because it does feel it's a very emotional book, and that can sometimes yeah. be hard to translate. Um, but we're going to talk about your new book, Cabin okay. at the End of the yeah, World, yeah. which is coming yeah. out June twenty sixth. June right? twenty sixth. Yeah. And I think I heard you mention this is a home invasion book. It is. Loosely. Um, yeah, I wouldn't even say loosely. It, it definitely would fit in that genre. And which was actually when I, when I got the, it was funny, I, I did get a little lucky, I think, with the idea for this one too, because uh, really briefly, I was in LA a few years ago for the Festival of Books, and I just sent my editor a short story collection to try to get back on deal. 
in a 30-page summary for this other book. And 30 pages is way too long for a summary. And I knew that when I wrote it. And the summary was so long, it felt like I wrote the book already. So I was kind of <laughs> like, oh, man. Like, I, I was sort of dreading, like, writing the story again. I mean, I would happily would have. But, uh, you know, my editor's sort of a no-nonsense person. She's like, yeah, the story collection, definitely, but this novel, nah. And my, my agent was really bummed. I was like, oh, okay. Um, and, and I'd been through a similar process with her with the, the second book, ap- or with the book after Head Full of Ghosts. Like, I'd sent her some ideas before we landed on Devil's Rock. Anyway, so on the plane ride home, I was just, like, doodling in my notebook. And I don't know, I had an idea about it, people in a cabin, and I started thinking about the home invasion sort of genre, like, you know, in a way that I thought of sort of the possession genre. It's like, oh, I really don't like home invasion stories as a rule. I, I, I tend not, I definitely don't watch them all. I tend not to enjoy them when I do. I think they can be really sort of easy and cheap and, and sort of uh, depend too much on, you know, sadism and the characters tend to be empty and you're just there to watch the violence. You know, I, I'm not being totally fair, but these are sort of the worst examples which typically Hollywood produces. Right, right. Um, so actually that got me excited. I was like, oh, how would I write a home invasion story that I would want to sit through, <laughs> that I would want to, you know, to read about? So that was sort of the challenge, and I was, you know, excited by it. And, uh, you know, I'm, if I do say so myself, I'm pretty happy with the results of the book. I mean, it is pretty damn dark and upsetting, but, uh, you know, I don't want to say too much, but I think, I think it'll be another book, hopefully like A Hitful of Ghosts, that engenders some discussion, shall we say. <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm really intrigued just by the idea that you would take something that you don't like <laughs> and think, right. how do I make this something I would like? Um, I think that's, that's really fascinating. Well, thanks. I mean, I think, I mean, you know, the one thing as opposed to a movie, I think it's a little bit, I mean, as someone who's never written a, a full screenplay, I think one of the things I would be, I would have a hard time with is, the, you know, how do you build a character through dialogue and visuals only? Like, you know, in a, in a novel, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very comfortable, you know, not to say that I'm the best or amazing at writing characters, but I'm much more comfortable in that aspect of writing, uh, creating characters in, in fiction. So w- one of my criticisms of the home invasion story is like these characters that you don't care about sort of even on both sides of the fence, like the people who are in the home. And I mean, that's easy to get sympathy for those people, but how about the people that are actually breaking in, even though they're, you know, they're there to ostensibly do horrific things. How do you get people not to care about them necessarily, but at least want to understand them and their motivations. So, you know, that was really for me like a starting point and that helped sort of lead the action of the story because of the things that I didn't want to happen. That sort of led me into places that I could go to, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does. And, you know, because I immediately, when I think about a home invasion story, and even if I think of one that's done well, I think of a movie like The Strangers, um, which, you know, that was a terrifying movie, <laughs> but also kind of infuriating for the reasons you're talking about, because it's literally people in masks who have no reason for going into this house. Right. Um, and terrorizing people. And you get the backstory of the people in the house, and you get to connect with the people in the house before they're brutally murdered. Um, (laughs) but you, you know, the only reason you're given is, you know, because you were home is like the, the line that they give you. And it is a little infuriating when you think about it, you know, okay, realistically, why would these people do this and who are they? Why are they hiding behind these weird doll masks? And, um, as a, as a, somebody watching, I feel manipulated and I don't like that. Yeah. Um, That's funny. I, so I, I've never seen Strangers. Part of the horror hipster in me avoided it because <laughs> I, I had heard it was essentially a remake of the French movie Eels. Yes. Um, which, <laughs> which, which I watched. And, uh, and I did sort of like, I, I thought it was you know, a decent movie. Like for as much as I, I, I really don't like home invasion stories, it, it was fine. But I didn't want to like watch it, the American version of it, essentially. Um, yeah, it, it it's funny. So, like, I, I knew enough of the strangers to sort of have a reaction to it a little bit. I mean, I think the the image of them and their masks, or and just even the mask in general, because that comes up in other home invasion stories. I definitely play with that uh, in in the book. Um, yeah, I mean, that was to me one of the fun challenges. You know, it's hard to say it's fun because <laughs> you know it is sort of a brutal book. But you know, I, 
not in a needless way. I hope, it, you know, I don't want to sound too glib on that, but yeah, I mean, I tried to give a reason, even if, when I say a reason, at least there's a motivation behind why these people are doing what they're doing. Um, th that it makes things harder for everybody, I guess. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely, you know, an intense book. Um, I, I definitely felt that when I was writing it and I've been, you know, even the people who, <laughs> some of the, even people who haven't liked it, like, you know, I try not to read all reviews, but I dip in now and then, you know, a lot of reviews have been positive, but I've read a, like one review was to the guy. I just felt sick after reading the book. I was like, ah, oh, that's pretty cool, I guess, in a way. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that could also, not necessarily just from the violence or what happens, but I think also from sort of, I don't know, some of the implications. Like, if if you read this and believe what what, hap what is happening is supernatural, then, yeah, I, I, I can totally see why you would be really unsettled by that. Not to say that if you didn't think something supernatural wasn't happening, you'd be unsettled, too, but. I don't know. How do you like my tap dancing around and trying not to give too many, uh, <laughs> too many things away? Well, about yeah, the book. it's hard yeah. with a book that's still on pre-order and that, um, but I did, I did see where they're comparing it to like, um, Jack Ketchum's The Girl Next Door or Stephen King's Misery. Would yeah. those be apt comparisons? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think maybe, uh, you know, some of it is just, you know, obviously the publisher looking for it comparisons or comps as they say right. in the biz <laughs> right to get people excited i mean you know misery maybe because it, i mean essentially it takes place in one spot like this this book could be a play it takes place in a cabin that's it um you know there's a television on the wall that's sort of their outlet to the outside world so you see some stuff on that but essentially you know the seven characters are start you know are in this cabin um so i mean so uh, maybe the claustrophobia of misery a little bit right um and as far as um, The Girl Next Door by Jack Ketchum, yeah, I don't know. I mean, they're definitely two very different stories. But, I mean, I guess so. I mean, the idea that you can – these, uh, I guess there's a connection in the idea that in Jack's book you have these, quote, unquote, normal next door people, right, everyday people, you know, as loaded a term as that is, are, are capable of these really horribly transgressive things. Um, I would say that's uh, – a connection between the two. But honestly, it was just, you know, <laughs> hard to find a lot of um, literary home invasion stories that you could compare to, to be honest. I mean, there's tons of movies, but, you know, what is there, Straw Dogs? Um, I mean, Wait Until Dark, which I really like as a, as a play. I don't think that was ever a novel. Um, in, in terms of, like, famous home invasion stories that are novels first. Right. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't really think of many. Um, but I'm excited. I mean, I'm gonna, I've got the book on pre-order. So oh, June, June 26th, <laughs> I'll be reading it. <laughs> uh, I'm excited. Um, Thanks. yeah. And I think I will say, I think this book, uh, makes for like a nice sort of thematic arc with a head full of ghosts, disappears to devil's rock in the cabin at the end of the world. Um, you know, they're all about families in distress or, you know, different, you know, they're all, you know, feature different sorts of families. Um, in different types of situations, but I don't know, I kind of, and almost like, nah, I don't, without getting too obnoxious, I, I feel like the three books sort of like build off of each other until like, oh, you thought these last two were the, you know, the ambiguous case, you know, and this third book, <laughs> I think sort of presents like an ultimate ambiguous case. Um, <laughs> because I know I can't do that forever too. Like, I don't right. want to be like, even though my editor playfully calls me Mr. Ambiguous Horror, I know I can't do that forever or all the time without being annoying. So, you know, maybe these three books are the, the, the ambiguous cycle <laughs> and then we'll try something a little bit different with the, the next novel, whatever that is. So with that being said that <laughs> you're always <laughs> already kind of jokingly, Mr. Ambiguous horror. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you see yourself continuing with horror or maybe branching back out into like crime or, um, maybe even more the dreaded term literary right. <laughs> fiction. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, uh, I've always, to go back to Joyce Carol Oates a little bit, one of the things I've admired is how in her career is how she gets to, you know, she writes whatever she wants, essentially. It could be a horror story. It could be, you know, a family epic. Like, you know, we are the Mulvays. Is that the name of the, mm -hmm. 
Uh, I'm terrible with titles, but you know how she every book of hers is you know is different and, and sometimes not classifiable. Uh, class a, you can't really classify it. Um, I would say same with Stuart Onan, who's a favorite, um, and, and you know Jonathan Lethem. So I don't know. I mean, I I definitely feel like you know as loaded as loaded as both terms are, I, I kind of feel like I approach horror in a literary way. You know, that's not to be you know to be obnoxious, but just the idea that yeah, I'm, you know, I am trying to build you know characters and theme and and sort of the other parts and bits of literary fiction um, and try to cross those two genres because I do think literary fiction is a queer genre with their own sort of, um, with their own sort of tropes and elements. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I think as, as long as I'm with William Morrow, my current editor, that it'll, it, would, it would have to be some sort of dark fiction. Um, so I don't know. This next novel, it's not due until the summer of 2019, so I have like a year and a half. I, I haven't committed to doing the idea that I have, but it would be slightly different than the other books that I'm doing. You know, I also realize that I've been doing a lot of families and kids stuff too. So I think I might sort of purposely break away from that a little bit, but at the same time, I'm sure it'll sneak in a little bit because I just, it's where I always come back to. So I'm basically saying, yeah, I don't know what the hell I'm doing next. <laughs> other than uh, I do have a short story collection due this summer. So I have one more story to write and uh, that'll be done. Um, and so, and actually in this collection, um, some of the stories have connections to A Head Full of Ghosts and Disappearance of Devil's Rocks, or purposefully so. Uh, the collection is going to be called Growing Things and Other Stories. Uh, so Growing Things is, you know, the story that Marjorie and Mary tell each other in this, uh, you know, in A Head Full of Ghosts. So that was a short story first that I'd written in, in like 2009. So uh, that'll lead off the collection. And the last story, which I haven't written yet, is going to be a story... Um, that takes place after a head full of ghosts where Mary's at a convention because the book has come out and she's confronted by a fan and she decides to tell this fan a Mary Marjorie style story. So, I mean, Mary's really only part of the frame. The story that she tells is sort of more just, uh, you know, sort of the same vibe as like what the growing things did in a head full of ghosts, I guess. Um, yeah. So that's what I'm trying to finish up at this, at this point in time and then get to the novel, figure out what it is. Well, we look forward to it, definitely. Thanks. Well, I guess, Paul, I'll just ask you one last thing. Sure. If, since our listeners um, are fans of the horror genre and are fans of yours, um, and I like to think of them as rather smart and intelligent horror fans, um, <laughs> if you could leave them with a recommendation maybe for one book and one movie. Oh, boy. One book and one movie. Oh, no. Um Jeez. Well, um, I'm going to cheat and give you two books. Um, and I'm just going to go with recent ones, maybe that they haven't read. Because I don't want to name something because they're clearly smart readers and well-read readers. <laughs> so they probably read. So I'm going to give them two books that they probably haven't read that have come out in the last year. Uh, one is, they're both collections. One is She Said Destroy by Nadia Bulkin. Um, I wrote the introduction for it. I'm, I've been a big fan of her short fiction for years. And this is her first collection. Uh, and she writes socio-political horror stories, but they're not didactic. You know, they're not like sort of in your face with, with politics. It's very sort of natural to the stories. Um, and, and no one writes like Nadia. She's just a, a different experience when you read her. Um, and I would also recommend Things We Lost in the Fire by Mariana Enriquez. She's an Argentinian writer, and this is her first book um, translated into English. Um, in my, my first comparison would be, I felt like I was reading a Shirley Jackson collection, a Shirley Jackson 2018 collection. Uh, it's that good. It's one of my favorite wow. collections of the past 10 years. Uh, so I'd recommend those two things. As far as movies, um, man, uh, Lake Mungo is one of my favorites. I mean, I'm obsessed by it. Uh, I own two copies, one to keep on my, one to keep in my personal belongings at all times and one to loan out to people. It's the only, <laughs> it's the only movie I own two DVD copies of. Um, yeah. All right. So I, I, I'll, I've talked enough. So I, I give you two books in one movie. I only that, treated once. That's, that's perfect. And yeah. I, you know, to me, I always know that's when I really love something is when I buy two copies to <laughs> lend to somebody because right. I won't give up my original. <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much for talking to us. Well, thank you. This was great. Yeah.